Okay, so uh, the Nussbaum is the last thing that we're going to be reading that's directly concerned with education. So we're going to be moving on to the language and rhetoric cluster next week. So what I want you to read is the excerpts from uh, Plato's Gorgias for next time. Um, and you know, the attempt here is like, like what this is concerned with, like it's an attempt to uh, define rhetoric through conversation with a rhetorician and define like what its relationship is to truth, right? Um, so, you know, we'll work through that next time. Um, also, um, Exploratory Reflection 2 is going to be due on Monday night, right? So um, you can pick any one of the five essays we just read, right? You can do Sun Tzu, Seneca, um, Douglas, Ansaldo, or Nussbaum, um, and you're doing the same thing you did with the first Exploratory Reflection. So does anybody have any questions about anything? Um, that was the kind of pre-draft draft that you did, okay. right? The exploratory reflection was when you just looked at one okay. of the essays that we read and picked out a particular theme or idea in that or a close analysis of it, right? Okay. So yeah, that's, that's what I want you to be doing for this. And the instructions are still up on Georgia View in the assignments folder, so you can you know, uh, review those when, when you have time, and if you have any questions about them, uh, feel free to ask me. Does anybody have any other questions about anything else that's going on? Is that the direction center section? Uh-huh. Part, yeah, they, they're, yep, they're in the assignments folder. Yep, the directions are, the, there are three of them, and the directions are the same for all three. They're just on slightly different subjects. Okay, so then before we start talking about Martha Nussbaum, I know this maybe is getting a little bit tedious right by now, but I think it still is helpful each time to kind of review where we've been because it helps us to find connections, right? So let's go back for a second to Sun Tzu. And remind me what Sun Tzu's um, basic ideas about education work. Can you go to teacher? Yep. Get a teacher. Because it is impossible for someone to learn to be good on their own, right? Now, related to the idea of getting a teacher, what, what, does, he, uh, what does he believe should be your relationship to the environment? I think you're thinking of Seneca. Who was the next one? Right? Seneca is the live in harmony with nature guy. Oh yeah, Sun Tzu is the environment. Your environment. Yeah. Seems like what you surround yourself with how you like act as a person. Yeah, surround yourself with like positive influences. With good, yeah, with good influences, right? What, like, essentially, like, if you need to learn something, what is a teacher for you? Like, what, what, what is a teacher to you? Think about this in terms of the analogy he draws, uh, you know, between the guy swimming in the river and the guy using a boat, right? And the guy thinking and the guy studying. The guy standing on his tiptoes and the guy standing on a mountain. What's all that about? What is he, what is he ad ad advising you to do? Resources? Yes, make use of available resources, right? Anything that will make your learning process easier, use it. And what else does he have to say about education? Is there ever an end point? No. Yeah, it's a lifelong process, right? Yep, lifelong process of conscious activity. 
You do not learn by osmosis. It takes a lifetime of active work. And of course, right, Sun Tzu's idea of education is basically to avoid being evil, right? What he's, what he's suggesting we educate out of ourselves is uh, you know, selfishness and emotional indulgence, right? Now, what about Seneca? Seneca, we've already said that what Seneca's basic philosophy is that we need to learn to live in harmony with nature, right? Well, I think the one is like you can't fear what you can't change. Yeah. You need to learn to accept. Part of learning to live in harmony with nature is learning to accept or live with that what you can't change. Now, how does this relate to ideas of education? How does he apply this to education? What form of education, what form of study does he believe is absolutely worthless? Okay, yeah, astrology, <laughs> astrology he regards as worthless, right? Um, specifically, because what good does it do for me to know that Mercury, Mercury is retrograde and I'm going to have a bad day, right? If there's nothing I can do about that. It's going to happen anyway. But there's a more, there's a broader field that he has no respect for. It's not the liberal studies he has no respect for, right? Although he does think that they're not as good and as useful as people think they are. Vocational. Yeah, it's the vocational stuff, right? Vocational studies, things that are geared towards technical skill and making money that he has no regard for. I'm not another one. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> and what good are the liberal arts for him? Are liberal, are liberal studies are, uh, good in and of themselves, as far as Seneca is concerned? Was that the political arts? Yeah, exactly. Right. So, yeah, they're sort of, yeah, the liberal arts. are a foundation for building wisdom upon, but they don't actually teach it, right? He doesn't think, he thinks it's a lot easier to learn wisdom if you study the liberal arts, but that doing so doesn't make you wise, right? Doing so doesn't give you wisdom, right? Now what about Douglas? Let's go back to Frederick Douglas. What do we remember about Frederick Douglas? Yeah, self-taught. That's one of the big um, <clears throat> one of the big central issues in his piece, right? Is that he has to learn how to do this himself, right? Yeah. And why is his process so long? He didn't have a teacher. Yeah, his pro because he has no teacher and no access to formal education, right? All right, he's a teenager before he's able to write. Because he can't take advantage of the kind of systematic education that one would get at school, right? What else do you remember about Douglas's um, process or Douglas's theories of education? What does education mean to him? Um, for you? Yeah, education literally equates to freedom, right? His mind is freed by being able to read it gets him out of the confines of his master's house, and he is literally physically free by learning to write. And what else? So what, what, does, what does he do that Sun Tzu would approve of in particular, even though he doesn't have a teacher? Yeah. He makes use of his access to the shipyard and you know other little boys in the neighborhood and things like that. His free time. The free time he gets, yep. 
in order to learn how to write. Well, not, you know, not only did he make use of the Yeah, the, the, right, the fact that bread was available to him in the house mm -hmm. and instead of just eating it himself, you know, okay, I can use this to get something else that I want. I can trade it for something else, right? Yeah, so <clears throat> we see a lot of really clever use of resources in his narrative, yeah. Now, what about Gloria Anzaldua? What do we remember about her piece? What are her experiences with the American educational system like? Awful. By and large, awful, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that I think, yeah, uh, I think we might have mapped this out last time. Language equals identity equals freedom, right? Something like that. Remember one thing that was um, assimilation? I'm sorry, I did not hear a word you just said. I heard you. No, 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 assimilation. Actually, I did hear assimilation, no. but I didn't hear the rest of what you said. Go ahead. Oh yeah, when her mother wanted her to get rid of her ex. Yeah, the, yeah, um... Right, assimilation versus, um... I get like, sort of multi, like hybridity or multiculturalism, right? And she seems to come down primarily on the hybridity side of that model that Anzaldua's preference herself is clearly for cultural hybridity and cultural mixing of various kinds. And what needs to happen in order for this kind of mixing to occur in the formal educational curriculum? Is that going to be permitted by authority figures by and large? I think this is actually another place where she connects up with Douglas, right? What happens when she tries to teach those Chicano novels and poems to her students in uh, high school. They like shoot her down and say, no, you have to do it with the American writing. Yeah, the principal tells her that's not American writing and you have to stop, right? So she continues to do it, but on the sly. So <clears throat> because hybridity is both culturally pervasive and visible to most people, right? To the point we don't even think about it most of the time. Um, promoting it in school requires defining the system. Right. Douglas defied a system that wouldn't let him get educated at all. Anzaldua is <clears throat> defying a system that is trying to mold her and other Chicano students um, into what um, an Anglo educational system believes they should be, right? Didn't that also take her a lot of time? Like, <clears throat> get her point across? Uh, what do you mean to get her point across? I like what she was talking about. Like, what you said. Yeah, I mean, she doesn't face struggles on quite the same level that Douglas did, right? But, you know, she does have a hard time uh, in her PhD program um, convincing an advisor to work with her on Chicano novels, right? Um, she has difficulties in school uh, because she's punished for speaking Spanish and for correcting the teacher's mispronunciation of her name, right? And you know, when you mispronounce somebody's name, what should be your what what should your response be, whatever your position of authority is? Right? 
I'm sorry, right? Right. and try to do it correctly the next time, right? Um, and the teacher doesn't do that, right? The teacher t just tells her to speak American and sh or shut up. So yeah, so Anzaldua also documents a number of microaggressions that occur in a society that is not comfortably integrated and that demands assimilation to a particular cultural ideal, right? Now I think that we may end up seeing a lot of similarity ultimately between some of the things that Zaldo was arguing and some of the things that Martha Nussbaum is talking about. But to introduce uh, Nussbaum's ideas, I want to look briefly at a passage from a novel by Charles Dickens called Hard Times. And to set this up for you, uh, this is taking place in a school that is run uh, by a schoolmaster who, uh, whose name is Mr. Machokum Child. Dickens' names are often kind of like punny in that sort of way, right? Um, it's been founded by a philosopher named Thomas Gradgrind who believes that the only things that are of value are verifiable facts. And so he wants to make sure that all the children in this school are getting a thorough grounding in absolute fact. And so what I want you guys to do is just kind of is read this passage from, uh, it's the, from the beginning of the second chapter of the novel. And just tell me what you think both of Sissy Jupe, girl number 20's failure to respond, like why can't she answer this question? And also of Bitzer's actual response, the one that is approved. Cecilia Jupe, let me see. What is your father? He belongs to the horse riding, if you please, sir. Mr. Gradgrind frowned and waved off the objectionable calling with his hand. We don't want to know anything about that here. You mustn't tell us about that here. Your father breaks horses, don't he? If you please, sir, when they can get you to break, they do break horses in the ring, sir. You mustn't tell us about the ring here. Very well, then. Describe your father as a horse breaker. He doctors sick horses, I dare say? Oh, yes, sir. Very well, then. He is a veterinary surgeon, a farrier, and a horse breaker. Actually, her father is a clown in a circus. That's what, the, that's what the horse riding refers to. Give me your definition of a horse. Sissy Jupe thrown into the greatest alarm by this demand. Girl number 20, unable to define a horse, said Mr. Gradgrind, for the general behoof of all the little pitchers. Girl number 20, possessed of no facts, in reference to one of the commonest of animals. Some boy's definition of a horse. Bitzer, yours. Bitzer, said Thomas Gradgrind. Your definition of a horse. Quadruped. Graminivorous. Forty teeth, namely twenty-four grinders, four eye teeth, and twelve incisive. Sheds coat in the spring. In marshy country, shed hoofs too. Hoofs hard, but requiring to be shod with iron. Age known by marks and mouth. Thus, and much more, Bitzer. Now, girl number twenty, said Mr. Gradgrind, you know what a horse is. What do you make of this definition of a horse? How helpful is it to understanding what a horse is? Not very helpful. Yeah, it's a collection of seemingly disconnected facts, right? Okay, so it's got four feet, it eats grass, it's got this, it's got 40 teeth, it sheds its coat in the spring, sometimes its hoofs. And isn't that like some kind of monster a horse? Yeah, I mean, it would be hard to get a picture of what this creature looks like or smells like or how it behaves, right, from this description, right? Because, yeah, this is just a collection of facts with no contextual information, right? So which of these two characters, Bitzer or Sissy Jupe, probably actually better knows what a horse is? And what, yeah, why does she probably have a better sense of what a horse is than this little boy does? Because her father is a horse Yeah, I mean, she has experience of actual horses, right? She may not be able to tell you what a horse is, in part because the question seems absurd to her, right? Like, wait, like, what, what, what is a horse? You really not know what a horse is? 
but to the other students in the school, all a horse is is a collection of facts, right? That they are expected to memorize. Kind of like his definition of a horse? Yeah, like his definition of a horse, yeah. Yeah, does this yeah, sound like a definition that would be produced by someone who had ever seen or been near a horse? I mean, maybe, right? But there's no indication of it in the definition, right? You know, along similar lines, the philosophers in Aristotle's academy came up with a definition of a human being as a flightless biped with no feathers. All factually correct, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, like essentially, like, what, what is, you know, what's the goal of this particular definition? Like, what are they? What, what is? What are these philosophers trying to distinguish us from? From birds, right? So, because birds are also bipeds, they also have two legs. You know, it has to be specified that we don't have that we are flightless, right? And there are also flightless birds, right? Penguins and chickens, for example. So to distinguish us from flightless birds, you know, then we need the, the distinction that we have no feathers. So, <laughs> so the thing is, right, that like these are incontestable facts, right? But they're useless. They don't really tell us how to weigh information, right? They don't really tell us um, how to judge situations in which we're involved either with other people or with horses, right? Um, it's something that's easy to test and easy to memorize, but it's not something that actually gets you at the thing itself, right? And I think a lot of Nussbaum's argument here falls along similar lines here, right, when she's talking about education for profit and for democracy. So, right, I don't actually need to turn the light on again because I didn't turn it off in the first place. So let's start with that first big distinction that she makes, right? For profit, against for democracy, right? Two different potential purposes for education. Which side of the binary do you think, uh, given what you've seen in the essay, she comes down on? Which do you think she prefers and why? Okay, yeah, and why, why democracy? In the first part, she has the Constitution on there. <laughs> okay, yeah, she's got the preambles of two different national constitutions here, right? The U.S. Constitution, uh, from the end of the 18th century and the Indian Constitution from the mid 20th century, right? Is it like to compare the two? Um, yeah, I think there is, some, yeah, there is some comparative weighing going on here, right? So let's actually think about that for a second. Let's think about why a Constitution has a preamble in the first place. What is a preamble? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I mean, that's not inaccurate, but it's go no ahead, Serenity. <laughs> okay, well, we, we might think of it as being similar to the introduction of your of a paper. I was going to say something about the yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, your, your thesis is essentially where you state your goal, right? And a preamble is 
a statement of goals and ideals. Right? This is the type of society ideally we are trying to create. And then the rest of the Constitution will outline how you're trying to get there, right? You know, what laws you are setting up to achieve these particular goals. And let's just take a minute and sit with these two different preambles. Um, and I want you to think about what kind of goals they're so like, what do you notice about the goals that they're arguing for here? Like, like what, what kinds of things do we see being argued for in both of these preambles? And just sit, look them over for a minute and speak up when you have something. Ask you this: Do these constitutional preambles frame their goals in terms of private individual goods or in terms of social goods? I just want social. Yeah, I mean, like you know, the, uh, the you know the one of the main the clauses here in the. You, preamble of the U.S. Constitution is in order to form a more perfect union, right? And the Indian Constitution said, you know, we resolve to secure to all our citizens justice, economic and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship, so on and so forth, right? So, in both cases here, what we're talking about is a collective. Right? How to secure the rights and define the duties of a collective. And what do the US government and the Indian government at least theoretically have in common in terms of the form, the type of government that we're talking about? Democracy. Yeah. We're talking about democracies. And What does it mean to live in a democracy? To participate in a democracy? Yeah, we the people of the United States are again a collective statement there, right? Um, and yeah, so the people elect representatives, right? Because in a large nation like the US or India, direct democracy is um, unworkable, uh, at least theoretically. But part of the issue here is, yeah, the citizen participation is expected, right? People are supposed to be taking part in affairs of state, affairs of government, right? So what then do you need to be able to do to be able to understand in order 
to participate meaningfully in a democracy. And that's where, where Nussbaum's concern is, right? Is that the models of education that are becoming more common in the developed world, particularly the United States and in certain rising powers like India, are much more focused on encouraging economic growth than they are on actually making sure that every citizen is able to participate meaningfully in democracy. Right? You know, does participating meaningfully just mean voting? No. I mean, even voting, yeah, kind of requires you to be able to weigh arguments, right? And you know, to decide between different candidates and like, God, like, have, have you guys ever tried to read one of the ballot measures? Um, that come up at election time. So sometimes, like in addition to having candidates for office running, right, you will have um, these referenda on like changes to the state constitution or to, to state law, things like the things that are put to the people to vote on. But they're always worded in really confusing ways. So it's often hard to know what it is you are actually voting for or against. So for example, you know, they might, um, like I remember a couple of uh, a couple of years ago, there was a referendum on whether a fund should be established solely for the use of you know um, like um, alleviating the suffering of victims of uh, child uh, like child trafficking things like that, um, and the way the <clears throat> the way the ballot measure was worded was so confusing that it was hard to know exactly what it was for or against, right? Which is one of the reasons I'm having a hard time describing it. But citizens in a democracy need to know how to parse these kinds of things, right? How to essentially kind of like cut through the bullshit and figure out what these things actually mean. The problem is that we have education systems that don't help us do that. Right, what is the main form of assessment and did, you, did you guys both go to public school? Okay, so what's the main form, what, what was your main form of assessment? What did you have to do at the end of every year in pretty much every grade? Yeah, big old standardized test, right? And what kinds of things can you measure on standardized tests? Mostly it was memorization. Yeah. I mean, Standardized tests are mostly designed to be graded by a machine, right? So you fill in the bubble, and you know, your teacher is going to sit there and grade all of those, right? They probably don't have time. It's all going to get run through a Scantron machine, and it'll spit out a grade, right? So how good are standardized tests at measuring thinking? Typically not very, right? Because the kinds of things that measure, like, the kinds of, uh, like, test responses that measure thinking, you know, these are things like, you know, short essay questions, written response, right? Things that, you know, ask you a question and require you to consider the answer for yourself, right? To come up with an answer using what evidence is available to you. And these are the kinds of things Nussbaum is arguing you need to know how to do as a citizen of a democracy that memorization of facts doesn't really help you with, right? And you know, this has been, in the US, a bipartisan issue, right? Both parties have favored this particular kind of approach to education, um, in large part because what they were trying to do was arguably fix failing schools by holding them accountable, right? It's like, okay, if your school isn't doing well, as measured by these standardized tests, then we need to figure that out and we need to um, do something to address that, right? The problem is, well, one of the things that's typically done to address that is withhold money from the school until they get their act together. Um, and I don't know how you help a failing school by withholding funding from them, right? The other problem here is that education often kind of serves as a kind of proxy for other issues. So 
if we look district to district across the United States, we have some of the best public schools in the world and also some of the worst. Now, if you were looking at where the good schools and the poor schools are, where would you think the good schools mostly are? Well, it's not even, it's, it's not, it, it, it doesn't track quite that regionally. Well, think, think more about the type of neighborhood that these kinds of schools would be located, or the type of community. Where, would, where do you think the best schools probably are? Yeah, mostly in rich suburban neighborhoods, right? In fact, you find that there are relatively few private schools in places like that because they, they don't need them, right? The public schools are good enough. If you look at where the worst schools are, they tend to be in poor districts, whether they are rural or urban, right? You know, there's a great deal of urban poverty and a great deal of rural poverty in the US, right? So <clears throat> poverty is something that is much more politically difficult to fix and more politically difficult to address than education, right? So education for Democrats and Republicans became a kind of proxy issue here, right? It's like, well, if we can just educate people for the new economy, if we can just take all these out-of-work coal miners in Kentucky and West Virginia and teach them how to be engineers or, you know, software coders or whatever, right, then everything will be fine. But even if you are educating people for the new economy, um, <clears throat> no spout would argue, you're still not really educating them to participate in the broader system, right? So let's look at what she has to say here on page 48 um, about all this, right? Can I get somebody, one of you to read uh, from To Think About Education for Democratic Citizenship? To think about education. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> to, think <laughs> about <laughs> to think about education for democratic citizenship, we have to think about what democratic nations are and what they strive for. What does it mean, then, for a nation to advance? In one, view, yeah, in one view, it means to increase its gross national product per capita. This measure of national achievement has for decades been the standard one used by development economic, 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 economists. 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 <laughs> economists around the world as if it were a good proxy for a nation's overall quality of life. Okay, uh, you can keep going. Okay. The goal of a nation, says this model of development, should be economic growth. Never mind about distribution and social equality. Never mind about the preconditions of stable democracy. Never mind about the quality of race and gender relations. And, this, eh, and gender relations. Never mind about the improvement of other aspects of a human being's quality of life that are not well linked to economic growth. Empirical, mm -hmm. empirical studies have by, have by now shown that political liberty, health, and education are all poorly correlated with growth. One sign of what this model leaves out is the fact that South Africa, under apartheid, apartheid used to shoot to the top of development in, in indices, um, indexes. Indices. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of wealth in the old South Africa, and the old model of development rewarded the achievement or good fortune, ignoring the staggering distribution of inequalities, the brutal apartheid regimen, and the health and educational deficiencies that we did. Okay, so. A couple of things uh, to note here. So she is attacking a particular notion of national advancement, right, as being purely about economic growth. Because for what reason? What does the economic growth measure not take into account, broadly speaking? 
what, what is your PMP? So if we're just talking about economic growth, like how much money is being generated by a particular nation at a particular time, what are we not dealing with? If we're just talking about how much money is being generated, or how much economic activity is being generated. Yeah, so if we're just talking about how much the system is generating, right, we're not talking about how it's distributed. Um, how, have, have either of you ever heard of trickle-down economics before? Do you know what this means? It's also sometimes called supply-side economics. Is this uh, phrase at all familiar? Okay, so trickle-down economics is the idea that if you let large wealthy corporations and rich individuals keep more of their money and make it easier for them to make more money, then they will invest that money in the broader economy and the effects will trickle down to everyone, right? You look very skeptical about this, <laughs> and you should. <laughs> we've, we've been trying some, basically, in the US, we've been trying some version of this for the past 40 years, and it basically failed, right? Um, it can kind of empirically be demonstrated to have not done what it's supposed to do, right? We keep giving more and more tax cuts to rich people, and what that's been doing is then just funneling more and more money to rich people who don't spend it because they don't have to. Um, so, <clears throat> the other thing that she's doing here is drawing particular attention to, she's using South Africa as a particularly inflammatory example of this um, model of thinking, right? So rating South Africa as an advanced nation according to this model of thinking. Do you guys know anything about the history of South Africa? So I noticed you kind of stumbled over the word apartheid, right? This is not something you're familiar with at all. Okay, you know, maybe like some of this is just that you guys are too young and that this was all kind of stuff that happened before your lifetimes. Um, so I remember when I was in high school when the apartheid regime fell in South Africa. Now, apartheid is a word in a language called Afrikaans, which is what uh, white South Africans of Dutch descent speak. It means uh, sort of separateness or apartness. And it was a system of racial classifications um, in which white people occupied the top spot in society with access to the best jobs and the most freedom of movement, access to the most resources, money, and education. Below them were people of mixed race uh, who were much more limited in their movements, uh, you know, both their freedom of movements and their career prospects. Um, below them uh, were Asians, and below them were black Africans. I don't know why, I don't think that was like the caste system that they have, like the ranking. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it is a kind of caste system, yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's, very, it, it's, it's very similar to Jim Crow era segregation systems, right? Um, No, it's that. The, yeah, well, that's the thing is that the lar by like by far the largest part of the poor population was the least privileged in the system. Right? There are way more black people in South Africa than anyone else. Um, I don't know why. When you were ranking, I was like, you in South Africa? Yeah, was ruled for about seventy years by a tiny white minority. Now, this comes about initially because it was a, it, it was a British colony, 
And then when the, Brit when, when the British leave, the white people who were part of that British power structure then manage to maintain power for themselves, right? And then Nelson Mandela becomes the first black president of South Africa um, in the 90s. I think I was in eighth or ninth grade when that happened. Um, because I remember it being an enormous deal, right? Um, but the reason she cites South Africa as an example here is like, you know, here's a country that has a lot of wealth, in part because it is very economically productive and there are a lot of mineral resources. But at the same time, this wealth was propping up a system in which most of the nation's citizens were living in abject poverty uh, with very little in the way of human rights, right? So that this growth measure of advancement did not take into account the actual conditions under which most people were living. And you know, like this is an extreme example. Like we can also look at the way different, um, like different places in the United States have developed, right? Particularly over the past half century or so. If you look at some place like Youngstown, Ohio, which is a former industrial area that you know where the jobs have mostly dried up now, or even some place like Americus, uh, which is you know had primarily an agricultural economy, um, but because crop prices are low and agribusiness dominates, um, you know, there's still a great deal of poverty here as well, right? Um, and we can compare this to the kinds of places where there has been a lot of economic activity and a lot of growth, right? Mostly big cities, right, like New York and San Francisco. So if we average out what's going on in Youngstown and Americas with what's going on in New York and San Francisco, then we come up with a kind of mean number, like a kind of median number that doesn't look too bad, right? The problem is that we're then papering over what's going on in these places where there is a lot of poverty, right? And these we're also papering over problems in some of these places where there is a lot of money and a lot of opportunity. Because like, you know, people can't afford to move there because it's become too expensive, right? San Francisco, the Bay Area in particular, um, you know, real estate prices are out of are out of control because you know the tech boom is you know, centered there. You've got all these educated workers who want to go there, but they can't find any place to live. So, if we're just looking at raw numbers, economic growth is a bad measure for whether or not we're actually achieving our goals as a society, right? So that for her is a strike against education that's intended for profit, right? Now, if we look a little further down here, proponents of the old model sometimes like to claim that the pursuit of economic growth will by itself deliver the other good things I have mentioned health, education, a decrease in social and economic inequality. This is what I was talking about here, right? This is the trickle-down economics theory. By now, however, examining the results of these divergent experiments, we have discovered that the old model really does not deliver the goods as, as claimed. Achievements in health and education, for example, are very poorly correlated with economic growth. No, nor does political liberty track growth, as we can see from the stunning success of China. So producing economic growth does not mean producing democracy, nor does it mean producing a healthy, engaged, educated population in which opportunities for a good life are available to all social classes. Still, everyone likes economic growth these days, and the trend is, if anything, toward increasing reliance on what I've called the old paradigm, rather than toward a more complex account of what society should be trying to achieve for their people. So this last sentence brings into focus another problem she has with the economic growth or for-profit notion, right? It's too simple. Right? Education 
for profit is comparatively easy to run and to administer. Education for democracy is much more complex, just as fixing the kinds of problems that she talks about here require more complex solutions, right, than simply encouraging economic growth. And I think it's also probably a good idea if we take a quick look at the kinds of things that the, that the for-profit model of thinking um, and her account of it does um, to education. Um, can I get one of you to read on page 51 from another aspect of the US educational tradition? It's the first full paragraph there. Another aspect of the US educational tradition that similarly infuses assimilation into the growth directive model and its characteristic emphasis on the active participation of the child in inquiry and questioning. This model of learning is associated with the long Western philosophical tradition of education theory, ranging from Jean Jean Jacques. Okay. Rousseau in the 18th century and Don Dewey in the 20th includes such eminent educators as Frederick Burgo in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, Johann. You, 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 can, you can skip ahead to okay. this tradition argues. Um, this tradition argues that education is not just about the passive assimilation of facts and cultural traditions, but about challenging the mind to become active, competent, and thoughtfully critical in a complex world. This model of education is supplanted an older one in which children sat so on desk all day and simply absorbed, and then regurgitated the material that was brought by work. This idea of active learning, which usually includes a large commitment to critical thinking and argument that traces it through its back to Right. Socrates, Socrates. Mm -hmm. has profoundly influenced American primary and to some extent secondary education, and this influence has not yet ceased despite increasing pressures on schools to produce the sort of student who can do well on the stuff. Okay, so what's the model of education that we're talking about? What, what, is, what does she mean here by active learning? What do you think an active learning education looks like? Participation. Okay, yeah, participation, right? The student actively participates in their own education. What else? Like, what, what other features do you think like an active learning environment has? Yeah, so I think, yeah. I, mean, I just got yeah. that from what she said, what she said, yeah. thoughtfully critical in the complex yeah. world. Yeah, I, I, I think, like, yeah, that's kind of the word, is that there, there's questioning going back and forth, right? Yeah. Is that the teacher and the student are, like, the teacher's asking questions to the students, but the students are free to ask questions back, right? And that much of what you're expected to do is interpret the material that you're given rather than simply uh, regurgitate. Now, if we think back to, um, what I gave you from the Dickens novel at the beginning of class, right? Now, what does that model of education look like? Think passive about. Assimilation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> passive assimilation, yes. That is pretty exactly probably what Nussbaum would say about that, right? That, that Bitzer has successfully passively assimilated information that's been given to him so he can spit it back out in time for the test. Um, there was a, uh, a Brazilian educational theorist by the name of Paulo Freire. And Freire was incredibly critical of what he called the banking model of education. So this banking model, according to Frere, was one in which the student's mind is, essentially the student's head is empty like a piggy bank. And the teacher is just filling it with knowledge and then extracting those coins of knowledge from the student when needed, like a test time or whatever, right? And that this doesn't actually teach anyone to think. That this might create compliant workers 
but it doesn't create students who are able to participate actively in you know the life of their community um, or in particular or you know in the life of a democracy right would that like relate to civic when he was like firing don't fire too much or something yeah i mean if he, if he says that um yeah acquiring too much knowledge um particularly if it's useless right is uh, is a fault, but he also says that having some knowledge is better than having no knowledge. Right? It's better to be um, it's better to be pedantic than it is to be an idiot, right? Or to be completely ignorant. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think there I think there is a connection. Um, there is one. I think that like, like Seneca would want you to learn the liberal arts in order to question their value. So there's part of a critical there's part of a critical thinking tradition there as well, right? Now, if we frame this in terms of history, and this is something that Nussbaum talks about as a history education, right? There is a debate in U.S. schools um, between conservatives and liberals and academics over how history should be taught in schools, right? So are you guys familiar with this at all? Like what the two sides of this particular debate about American history in schools? Is. Okay, this, this isn't. I'm going to go with no. Okay, all right. Okay, so the conservative position is that students are being taught to be ashamed of being Americans by being taught history in ways that kind of questions the traditional narrative, right? So what they want is for history to be taught in terms of positive achievements, right? Teach what's good about America, what America has done right and done well. And what a lot of this would be, would be kind of like memorizing names and dates and events, right? Without really thinking over their implications. Just you're told that this is good and you're expected to accept that, right? So on the other side, there's a notion that what we really need, if we are trying to prepare students to participate in democracy, whatever their politics are, what we really, what they really need to be able to do is critically engage with our history. See what we've done right and what we've done wrong, right? Be able to think for themselves about the historical narrative. Right? Now this doesn't just come down to, um, you know, denigrating all you know, great American historical figures, um, or you know, you know, say that, you know, that America is a failure or a piece of shit or whatever, right? What it does come down to is presenting a fuller picture of figures, for example, like Christopher Columbus, who you know, yes, you know, he sailed to North America accidentally because he thought the world was a lot smaller than it actually was and didn't realize there was another continent there uh, between. Europe and Asia. Um, and, you know, we need to know what he did when he got here, too, right? We have to take that into account. He was trying to reach India, yeah. And in fact, initially he thought he did. Um, no one, and, you know, the, the, if you take nothing else away from this class, just remember this. No one ever actually thought the world was flat. We have always known that the world is round. Right, the ancient Greeks were able to calculate its circumference uh, accurately in the sixth century BCE, and you can't calculate the circumference of something you don't think is round, right? Where did, it, where did it even come from? It comes from a biography of Columbus that the American author Washington Irving wrote in the early 19th century. That's where the that's where the idea comes from. Um, but yeah, no one has ever actually thought the world was flat. However they did think that there was nothing in between 
Europe and Asia on our side of the planet except ocean. So the problem wasn't that you would sail off the edge of the earth if you went too far. The problem was that you couldn't possibly bring enough food and fresh water for the trip. So you, know, you would starve or die of dehydration before you got to Asia. Um, so that was what people actually thought then, right? So again, you see here what we're doing is critically engaging with the historical narrative, right? And you know, correcting a misconception that people have, right? Um, but again, you know, you know, people have to be aware of the full history of what you know these not only you know, the, what, what these great figures were, but what these great events were, you know, in American the American story, right? The American narrative. And that, you know, we do construct narrative for particular purposes. Because if we were to adopt with the conservatives would like to happen mm -hmm. in the schools, how would we advance as a nation? If, if that, all we yeah. knew was positive stuff. And I think that that's, that's the question that Nussbaum is asking here, right? And I think that one of the issues here is that the goal, like what we're talking about are different educational goals here, right? I think that you know this is a model that fits in more easily with the seeking, with the profit-seeking motives of education, right? With training a compliant workforce to memorize facts. In fact, she even actually she talks about this um, in the context of India on page 53, right? A silent example of this approach to history can be found in the textbooks created by the BGP, the BJP. India's Hindu Nationalist Political Party, which also pursues aggressively an economic growth-based development agenda. These books, now fortunately withdrawn since the BJP lost power in 2004, actually this, you know, this essay is old, the BJP is back in power now, it has been for a couple of years, utterly discouraged critical thinking and didn't even give it material to work with. They presented India's history as an uncritical story of material and cultural triumph in which all trouble was caused by outsiders and internal foreign elements. Criticism of injustices in India's past was made virtually impossible by the content of the material and by its suggested pedagogy, for example, the questions at the end of each chapter, which discouraged thoughtful questioning and urged assimilation and regurgitation. Students were asked simply to absorb a story of unblemished goodness, bypassing all inequalities of caste, gender, and religion. So, for-profit education and unthinking, unquestioning nationalism are very kind of closely related in Nussbaum's argument, right? That the whole idea of profit-seeking education is to get people to not ask too many questions, right? To train people rather than to educate them. And we're running out of time here, but like the, the last thing I would suggest to you, like, um, just when you get a chance, what I would like you to do is look over on page 55 the skills that she regards as vital for democracy and think about like what it would take in an educational system to implement those, right? Like how would we actually educate for those kinds of things? Well, we don't have time to do that here and now. So, you know, that is something um, for another day on your own time. Um, right, so does anybody have any questions about this before I let you go? Okay, so in this kind of questioning frame of mind, um, so next time we're going to be reading Plato, and Plato writes all of his arguments in, like, they're framed as dialogues that his mentor Socrates has with various people Socrates is trying to humiliate. So what we're going to be seeing is Socrates asking a whole bunch of annoying questions of a rhetorician by the name of Gorgias to try to force Gorgias to reveal how weak his argumentative position is.